What's up? Matt, what's going on today? Oh, man. It's good to see you again. Yeah, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Did the girls enjoy their uh, their Christmas holiday? Oh, yeah. To be little again. Everything's the most exciting thing imaginable. Every present scream out of, you know, it's it's awesome. Oh, I miss those days. So what's the, uh, what's the best present? What did you feel like they thought their best presents were? Well, my uh, wife, who's a huge animal lover, got them bunnies. Like live bunnies. Yeah, well, I hope the kids never hear this because Santa Claus got them bunnies. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. If, <laughs> young children shouldn't be listening to this podcast. Well, anyway. you never know. Yeah, you never YouTube, know. YouTube, man, right? they, they get on there. That's, oh, that's true. Yeah, what am I talking about? So, well, so live bunnies, that'll be fun yeah. for you. Yeah. Hell yeah. I had wild rabbits when I was growing up, like wild cottontail rabbits that I rescued from the woods and we raised them. And my, we took them to this like rabbit specialist guy and my mom fed them with an eyedropper of evaporated milk and they said, oh, they're not going to live more than a year in captivity because they're wild cottontail rabbits. They live like 14 years. Who knew? Yeah, they're all gray with like beards. And nurturer. They look like the Gandalf of rabbits living <laughs> in our house. People would come over and be like, there's a, uh, I'm like, yeah, no, don't even bother. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's just like a dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, you ready? Let's do this. All right. We got a uh, great topic today. Um, we put this together uh, beforehand. Um, it is straight up, we're going to talk about buying a fitness franchise mm -hmm. and uh, what you should really look at if you're going to do that. So uh, before we get into our list, do um, you have anything to, to say before? No, uh, it's a good topic. Franchising is hot right now for reasons that we've talked about in previous podcasts. It's a great investment opportunity. It gives you a better return on investment as an entrepreneur if you go to sell. If you're an independent operator, it gives you systems and a massive shortcut to success. So there's a lot of reasons why you should, um, and, and I've backed those up before, and I really mean that. It can seem self-serving, some of the uh, you know, subjects or topics that we have, you know, buying a fitness franchise, but I would buy one now. If I was starting over and just cleaned the slate and said, hey, I want to get into business, whether it be pizza, fitness, sub sandwiches, whatever I want to do, I would buy a franchise because it's just a massive shortcut. And I know that my entrepreneurial um, genius, if you will, if I had any, um, would go into essentially the structure and the management, right. And the operation, operationalization of that franchise, which would mean that you have to, you know, put the work in and, and run the systems. It's one thing to have them created, but you still have to be an entrepreneur. So that's all I'll have to add is I, th I think it's a great avenue. I think it's very popular right now, which is why we're talking about it. Obviously, why we went there mm -hmm. as well. We felt like it's a better vehicle for our potential or our core customer, and a also, you know, ultimately a better vehicle for their core customer or the all the way through to the consumers, right? Who are our ultimate boss for everyone. I think it's just a better vehicle all the way around. So I'm excited to talk about it. Cool. All right. Well, let's get into the list. So the first thing um, that we uh, deemed to be important was pricing. So yes, what you got. Well, there's, there's a couple of ways to look at pricing. So when we say pricing, we're talking about the price of the franchise itself. So let's say that you're interested in getting into the fitness business. A lot of people like it. It's compelling. It has subscription renewable income month over month, mm -hmm. which is nice, right? A little better than having to make a sale like a hamburger, right? How, you know, visit maybe twice a month to this place. So you, it's just a little bit harder than it is to get a customer. You typically keep them longer, which means the revenue opportunities are higher. And everyone likes that, whether it be investors or, or individual owners. Plus, you know, you're, you're doing a really good thing for people, mm -hmm. right? Um, so then you start to look at, okay, what's my investment for a franchise versus starting on my own? And there are a lot of, certainly in fitness franchises that are, uh, we'll just call them inexpensive, right? And what I mean by that is there's typically two fees that you want to look at. One is the upfront fee, which is called the franchise fee. Yep. And one is your ongoing fee. And that's either a monthly subscription, right? Or a percentage or something along those lines. So if we look at the upfront fee, the franchise fee, I will tell you now that sitting on the other side of the fence, what I didn't know before is mainly that fee goes to cover training and onboarding, mm -hmm. right? For a new customer yep. coming in. And so if you're looking at a, a, a franchise opportunity in fitness and the upfront fee is say $15,000, which is not chump change, but it's not, the average is 50,000 by mm -hmm. the way. So if you're starting in at 15,000, right, as an upfront fee, um, you would just anticipate that you're not gonna be able to get as much support or you're not gonna receive as much support as you would be if there's someone that's in the average range, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just a fact and that's just basic, uh, economics of not being able to afford to onboard you properly, right? Or get you trained up. And that's really important. So first of all is the upfront fee. And then second, again, is the ongoing fee. And there are franchises that do a flat fee, right? And the sort of the, the brand promise behind that might be, 
Um, look, I, I want you to make money. And the more money you make, I want you to keep all of that money beyond this flat franchise fee. Yep. And th that sounds enticing, right? So if you were looking at a fitness franchise, it was a boot camp or something along those lines, and they're like, hey, it's $15,000 up front and it's 500 bucks a month. Okay, great. But I will tell you that having seen it from both sides and actually servicing franchisees as a license mm -hmm. and hearing about their experiences and now going into franchising, being able to see it from both sides of the fence again, that that is essentially a license, not a franchise, meaning you are not going to get the level of support that I think is necessary to be successful or that you're going to want or crave, right? Um, with that type of franchise structure, simply because there's not enough revenue there. If you understood the economics behind it, there's not enough revenue there to support those franchisees, sure. right? And so we chose to go with a higher franchise fee so we could do more robust training on the front end and then to do a percentage of overall revenue. And there's a reason why we did that. And so I'll just tell you a story. So um, we work with a, a major franchise, right? Worldwide franchise, they're amazing. Um, and they use a flat fee structure, which is cool. It's, it, it looks enticing to the owner. It's like, oh, sweet. Like, I'll just pay this much per month after mm -hmm. my upfront fee. And anything I do above and beyond that, I keep, right? It's not a percentage. There's one country that's in this sort of, uh, you know, brand that switched, that broke the mold and went from a flat franchise fee to a percentage yep. of revenue, right? So I happened to, to have the opportunity to speak to this group and then at a social event later, um, the, it had been one year since they had pulled the plug and basically switched. And imagine if you're a thriving business and you're going from a flat fee per month to a percentage of your revenue and you're already doing really well. Yeah. That's a tough pill to swallow. Big chunk of change. It is. And it took a long time for that. It's why it took a year to kind of take everyone through the process. So afterwards at a, at a social event, I was talking to a really sharp guy and he had won at the event earlier in the evening franchise of the year, right? Really smart guy. So we were, we were talking over a beer and I said, so what do you think about this switch over? You know, obviously he's still thriving. Mm -hmm. And he said, listen, it hurts a little bit to pay that extra money, but here's what I will tell you. I'm involved with several other franchises. So he is a franchisee of other brands that are non-fitness related. Yep. So he can is allowed to do that, if you will. And he said, there is a notable difference between the franchises that I, the other franchises I work with, which are percentage based right. and the flat fee franchise. And what I mean by notable is that franchise is more aligned with me and my goals, which is to make money. Those sure. are than the flat fee franchise. And it makes sense. If, well, absolutely. If, if I go to if if I went into business as a uh, franchisor and I'm like, look, I'm just we're just going to sell a bunch of these. I'll just sell them at 500 bucks a pop. What's the only way for me to make more money? Sell more franchise. Sell more units, right? Yeah. Now I can monetize other things in the franchise, right? Which I have to disclose, but I could monetize vendors and you know all types of other ways to make revenue. Or I could keep it simple and say, hey, I'm going to just I'm going to charge a percentage, and then as you, I'm going to help you do better because ultimately that's the only way that I do better, sure. right? And so it was interesting to hear someone who essentially was coming out of pocket with thousands of dollars more each month, but was actually okay to do it. He kind of said, ah, it's kind of painful because he was already successful, right? But at the same time, he understood having experienced a percentage-based franchise situation or relationship in other franchises, how much more support and how much more they were aligned with his goals of helping him make money, Sure, right? And so, and honestly, this is a relatively small country. So the switch from a flat fee to a franchise fee was simply for that. It wasn't a, a revenue grab. It was basically the realization that we can only put so many units in this country. If we don't have more revenue, we can't support our franchisees in yeah. the way that they need to be successful. So I'm not defending our position, but essentially those are the reasons why we chose the route that we did is so that we could be in alignment with our franchisees. Right. Meaning, okay, as they make more, like our job is to help you make more money. By the way, that's the only way we make money, right? Um, and and ultimately knowing then sort of the the pluses and minuses of each structure for the the franchisee, for the for our customer, essentially, yep. right? Um, it would be better for them if we were in this structure. So I would just say, if you're looking at a franchise and it's really low barrier to entry and it's a very low price um, per month just don't expect a whole lot of support. So sure. then you have to question, what is it that you're really buying? Is it a name? You know, how much training am I going to get? 
you know, that type of thing. So that was our experience. And that's why we chose to go with, you know, and when you're buying a fitness franchise, do you want the level of support that you're going to need to be successful? If so, you're going to have to pay for that. Believe me when I tell you, you'll be happy to do so based on the feedback that we've heard. Sure. Well, Does that make sense? It makes sense across the board, right? I mean, you want people, everybody working together to make money. I think it happened both ways, whether the franchisees or franchisor get that flat rate and they may become happy and they're not going to push themselves to get better. And, right. you know, that's not a good culture. So, so yeah, we we, we're strong proponents in that, right? As the water rises, all the ships rise as well. Sure. So it's like, listen, we're all trying to grow. I mean, we started this brand when I was in college. So it's like, listen, our goal is to help as many people as possible. And that means the businesses themselves and help change their lives for the better and their end users, right? So we have a passion for both. And the best construct for that, when you look at it, when you take a step back and you feel like that's our core values, that's what we're trying to do is help more people. The best structure for you as a franchisee, whether you're fitness or not, would be to be in alignment with your master franchise or your franchisor sure. in, in both of your goals or to help more people and make more money, right? I mean, even as a franchisee, if you're looking like you want you know, your other franchisees to be doing well, right? Well, yeah, that's another thing. I mean, if if it's a very low barrier to entry, the financial requirements to get into that franchise are probably less. And if that's the case, you're going to have less qualified people in the franchise. Now, you know, we we use words like compliance and things, and those really should be used interchangeably with like protecting your investment is essentially Mm -hmm. what you're doing. So if you get into a low barrier franchise, you may be the shining star in the franchise, but keep in mind, there's going to be a lot of people in that franchise with you who are not going to do the, any favors mm-hmm. for the brand overall. And it may hurt your overall valuation Absolutely. as a business, right? So reputation. it's just something to consider. And after looking at all the different options and working intimately with them, there were some franchises, not the one we were talking about before per se, but some other franchises that we engaged with who would say, I get more support and materials from you as a licenser when we were just licensing Mm -hmm. than I do from my master franchise. And I would always (laughs) be shocked by that, right? (laughs) But you think about it, in some cases, we were charging almost the same monthly fee Sure. Right. We didn't, we didn't um, be able, we weren't able to have any control necessarily, but we're basically charging the same fee. We're just providing a lot more for it. So it's kind of an interesting eye opener, like really, but now I get it now having seen both sides of it. So I would say when you're looking at the price of a franchise, keep in mind the average price these days is about 50 K to get started. Um, And if you're looking at percentage base, which is going to get you in alignment with your franchise or if you're buying that fitness franchise, look for something in that five to seven percent range. I think Orange Theory is now eight percent. Like if there's a resale, the territories are up, but if there's a resale or something, they're up to eight percent. But most franchises in general are in that six percent range, which is right where we settle. Cool. All right. Let's go to number two: sustainability, longevity. Kind of what you got? Yes. Well, this comes from the idea that fitness is very trendy. Right. So when you're investing in a franchise, you're typically signing a 10 year agreement. So you're on the hook to to in this partnership for 10 years. So if you're going to be in this partnership for 10 years, you really need to take a step back and look at overall market conditions. Right. And 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 really think, what is this thing going to look like in year five? Mm -hmm. Right. So we had the opportunity to sit down with a really dynamic guy. He was come from the financial world and he was connected to us by a friend and he came down and we went to dinner. And he had gone to the discovery day, which is when you go find out about franchise was for some other franchises in the fitness space. Cause he likes the model, right? Yep. And he's looking to invest. And a lot of the brands that are under this one banner are very on trend right now. Right. And they might do one modality, like, you know, might not necessarily Pilates, but rowing or something like that. And so then the question that he's asking in these discovery days, as should anyone is like, well, what does this business look like in year two or three? Right. Cause remember the franchise at the end of the day, if they're, if they think like we do, we're thinking of it as a true partnership and we're mm-hmm. awarding it to someone because we're allowing them to take our brand and, yeah. and do things with it. Right. But there are a lot of franchises who might be beholden to quick growth through private equity money, or, you know, maybe they're proposing to go public, something like that. And number of units is very important to them. And so they might be willing to, you know, push it a little bit harder to bring people on. I'm not saying that they don't care what it looks like in year two, three, but they may have a very short term plan that's not in alignment with your plans as a franchisee. So I would say if you're buying into a concept, look at the longevity of the concept, right? Like, do you believe in it? Do you think it's going to be around? Is it sustainable five, seven years from now? Even if you're going to sell your business in five to seven years, if there is a downturn in your business or the trend that you're buying into, it's going to hurt your ability to sell your business, even if you're not going to stay in for the full 10 years, which Mm -hmm. a lot of investors don't want to do. I get it. So I would say look at it. So when you look at fitness, especially, is so trendy. 
things come and go like overnight. You know, you look at uh, Curves as an example. Curves was one of the fastest growing franchises in the world, fastest falling franchise in the world. I don't know the history. I don't know if they made some bad choices or bad mistakes, but I will say overall that it was very trendy. Yep. It was the first like real meaningful women's only brand that appealed to women that weren't very fit, right? That were the older age demographic. And it looked really good, but something, it was a house of cards, right? So it blew up. And believe me when I tell you, the, uh, the people that create it, Right, are looking for that next trend. Oh, yeah. The one that benefits from this whole game, if you're going trendy, is someone that sits down and somehow lands on the right concept at the right time. Right? Sure. And they get connected to the right people and they blow it up and they sell out to private equity and they, and they go to the beach or they start a new, uh, uh, you know, a new business because these things have a lifespan of maybe five to seven years of when they're really, really popular. And we see some brands in market that are probably doing that now, right? So I would say look at it overall. What's the long-term sustainability? Because at the end of the day, it's your business. You're a small business owner, entrepreneur. Yep. If you want to work in it, and fitness is one of those industries where it's a noble business to work in and stay in. So if you want to stay in your business, make good money, and help a lot of people, you're going to want to do something that's not smoke and mirrors and super trendy, right? Sure. So you know if you're if the club design looks like a Russian vodka bar or something, it's like okay that might not stay around forever. You know maybe it doesn't <laughs> appeal to all demographics. You know maybe it only fits in. You know if, if the if the concept is coming out of Soho in New York City, it's like is it going to cross over to Kansas City? Right. Those are just things to think about. So make sure there's some history there that the scalability is proven out and that there's a story behind why this thing is going to stick around and help you make money long term. Yeah, Does I like the sense? Russian uh, vodka bar gym, maybe. You like maybe. that? Yeah, it's sure. all ice. It's all, all made out of ice, <laughs> right? Very trendy. Okay. <laughs> all right, awesome. All right, number three uh, is support. Yes, so it kind of goes back to pricing, mm -hmm. but that's a question you should be asking. So when you're buying a fitness franchise, you need to really find out what is the level of support that you're going to receive, ultimately, right? Because... Um, that could make or break you. So some of that is the onboarding. So we talked about it in, in uh, point number one, like the franchise fee up front. How much training are you going to get? You know, if you're going to get three days of training and some of it's remote, mm -hmm. that's not going to be enough to help you. I hate to tell you, even in a small business like ours, there's a lot of moving parts and you're going to need to be trained exactly on how to do those things. So part of the support is the upfront training. Yep. Right? So make sure that, again, the franchise fee threshold is enough to get you training. So I'd say six days of training would be a good place to start. Anything sure. less than that, you guys, it's really not going to be as beneficial. You know, it's yeah. not going to teach you what you need to know. So training up front and then ongoing support. So right now, the average sort of franchisee to franchise business coach, and I probably should explain that. So in a franchise structure, each franchisee gets a franchise business coach, if you will, right? And that's someone who's going to help support them, hold them accountable, help them you know, navigate through improving KPIs, things like that. And this is the sort of their their connection to the franchise ongoing. Yep. And that franchise business coach to customer ratio is different in different businesses. Now, the average is around 80 franchisees to one franchise business coach, which for real. <laughs> Some are much higher than that, right? And wow. I guess if you say, oh, we have a really simple model, but here's what I'll say. the It's a true partnership, right? We've talked about this. You're getting into a relationship with someone. If that's the case, um, I think that people need more support than that, right? So I would say, ask that question. What is your franchise business coach to franchisee coach to client ratio, yeah. right? So how many other clubs is my franchise business coach going to be working with? It's a fair question. Um, you know, we're going to hold steady around 30, you know, to one, which yeah. is our goal. And I think that that gives us, certainly it's more expensive on our end as a business structure, but I think it's the right thing to do. And again, that's, you go back to, again, the pricing question. It's like, great, we do a percentage. We can then afford to give you the type of support to help you be successful. Right. Yeah. Well, let's you know, go back number to start number two. You want longevity out of your business. We want it as well. So, and we know that there's going to be new hires and things like that. We want to keep you in the game, keep you rolling. And there's just a million and one in any small business, a million and one little questions. And part of that support is just bandwidth. We've learned that through our coaching groups and our licensing business as well, is that sometimes it's just nice to talk to someone who understands where you are. They have other people that they're working with that have mm -hmm. similar challenges. They can discuss those other solves like, hey, here's something that we find is working. Okay, so you're in a really busy urban market. Okay, that marketing play is probably not going to work. Mm -hmm. Here's what we 
are finding it works in your place. And of course, it's our job to coach our franchise business coaches to understand all these idiosyncrasies, which we've got 28 years in the industry, right? And have worked with a couple thousand gyms worldwide. So who better to teach the franchise business coaches sure. what our guys are going through? Plus, we're sitting on a couple of brick and mortars where we're oh, yeah. testing these things right now. So support's important. If you're buying a fitness franchise, it's a question that you should absolutely ask. How many franchisees will each franchise business coach be working with? Yeah, cool. Lower the better. All right, number four, we're going to talk about alignment. Alignment with um, franchisee to franchisor. Yeah, um, we've talked about this a little bit already, but it's a true relationship. You're getting into a partnership. So when we use terms, we don't sell, we're selling a franchise, we're awarding a franchise. You know, why do we say that? It's just semantics. Does it make it seem nicer? No. It's truly, we're awarding a franchise to someone. So certainly we're early on, we can't afford to have any stinkers out there, right? Our success, again, in our alignment is based on their success. So we can't have any stinkers. So we're very picky about the partners that we're going to align with, mm -hmm. you know, or we'll award, who will award a franchise to. They should be as picky about the franchise, the master franchise, right? And so at the end of the day, it's a business relationship. But as you know, Matt, and as I've seen, there's, you can't take the personal out of business relationships, Right. There's a guy on our team, um, Michael Okumian, who's MOK Capital, and he does a lot of mergers, M&A work or mergers and acquisitions in the fitness space. And he's seen deals get to the final hour and go sideways because of relationship problems. Oh, I'm sure. Right? Misunderstanding, lack of communication. It's all the human elements that you wouldn't think would make it into an X's and O's business deal, but they always do. Yep. That's the same sort of example that I would use with the relationship between franchisee and franchisor. There's always a bit of a friction there because, you know, the franchise is trying to hold you, for lack of better terms, compliance. Again, they're trying to protect your investment in their yep. terms. You're trying to be an entrepreneur, right? So there should be a healthy friction there, but it should be a good working relationship with very open communication. Yeah, absolutely. Typically, it's when there's either a lack of communication or confusing communication that sends you sideways. So I would say when you go to Discovery Day or you're working your way through the process, does this franchise align with you as an individual, right? Mm -hmm. If you're, is, is their heart in the same place that yours is? If, you're, if your main goal is investment, do they understand that that's your goal? Do they give you tips and ideas about ways to exit, right? And ways to scale and ways to grow. You know, are there multi-unit playbooks that you can work with, you know? Um, so there's a lot of things to consider around the alignment and you should be very selfish as a potential franchisee, right? What are my goals? Um, does this franchise align? And then at the end of the day, do you like them? Like, could you do business with these people? Yeah. Trust. Do you trust these individuals? What's their backstory, right? Yeah. Do they have any brick and mortars open? Do they have any experience in the industry? Right. If you're getting into a franchise that has maybe 20, 30 locations, you definitely need to be reaching out to the franchisees. I mean, so that it's just, it's more important maybe, and it's a little touchy feely and kumbaya sure. campfire ish, but honestly, it's maybe the most important thing. If you don't jive with the franchise and the culture, and if you're not down with what they're doing and the market they're going after or whatever, don't get involved. Because at the end of the day, you're in a 10-year relationship, and we're going to try to make it as intimate as possible, right? right? Or they should try to make it as intimate as possible. So again, when you're buying a fitness franchise, definitely consider your alignment as an individual, right. your core values. Does that align with the master franchise? Right. Can't solely go on numbers. Correct. All right, number five, and the last one for buying a fitness franchise, financials. Yeah, so you can go on numbers. Maybe. <laughs> it's kind of if important. They're really good. I mean, it's I a would. part of it. <laughs> if I'm taking, if I'm working somewhere in corporate and I'm like, listen, I'm tired of this gig. I want to do something on my own. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to get into fitness where I can change lives. I want to put my head on the pillow at night and feel good about what I do. Truly good that I'm making a difference in people's lives. I'm leaving this middle level management, whatever that is. And I'm going to dig into my 401k and I'm going to invest in my future mm -hmm. in a business, right? It has to make sense financially at the end of the day. So in every FDD, which is an acronym for franchise disclosure document, there is the potential to add something called an item 19. And the item 19 is simply the financials of the business overall, right? A lot of franchises don't do that because they have many franchises in market and they'll just turn you to those franchisees, Right. I think it's I think it's a good thing if they have it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it would be very fair for you as a potential franchisee to ask about the item 19. Do they have an item 19? Which are the financials? If yep. so, can you see it? Question how it was built, right? Because there's a couple different ways constructing an item 19 can be built. Is it legit, right? Where'd you get these numbers? I mean, right. there's a lot of legalities I'll tell everyone that's on the franchise side where you can't make this stuff up, right? You, yeah. you get in big trouble. There's a lot of compliance, as there should be. Yep. Um, but I... 
not all franchises have it, but I think it's really important. If they don't have an item 19, then you definitely need to dig in with the potential franchise. And if the master franchise just sends you one or two people that are dead ringers, yeah, ask around, like do some of your own work and call multiple franchises or simply ask for transparency going back to the alignment of the relationship. Okay. Can you give me a couple people that are doing really well? And can you give me a couple of stinkers? And first of all, I'd like to hear from your standpoint, you know, why would these people doing well? Why mm-hmm. are these not? And then I'd love to talk to those people. That would be a fair question, yep. right? And then you want to dig into the financials. So what you're looking for is, you know, how soon will you get a return on your investment, right? And if you're an investor type, you're looking at, all right, if I can get a return on my investment in, you know, 18 to 20 months, which is good for fitness, then that's really, really good. And if I can do that, um, and I can build this business and in five to seven years, I have the option to sell it. That's a pretty compelling conversation. If those numbers don't align or if they're mushy or if it's really expensive to get started and it takes you four years to get a return on your investment, right. it depends on the size of the investment and mm-hmm. what the ultimate upside would be. Maybe not a great opportunity for you. Yeah. Right. So financials um, are, are probably the most important thing as far as your investments concerned. Sure. Uh, and the, everything else that we've talked about affects the financials. So I would ask for an item 19 if they don't have that, ask for franchise names and make sure you get an equal amount of ones that are doing really well and then poor performers, get their take on it and then reach out to the franchisees and find out what their what their story is. Cool. All right. That's it, man. If you're buying a fitness franchise, that would be my top five. And that's what I've learned from being on the, working with franchisees on their side and then now building a franchise and understanding maybe from the franchisee side, some of the bigger sort of uh, friction points, if you will. And like, how can we solve those? And so we built it for that. Um, Check us out online. Reach out if you have any questions, but that is it, Matt. That's my my top five. Well, thank you. All right, my man. Talk soon.